The Lord be with you. Thank you for being here as God always gathers his people together, whether in larger gatherings or in smaller gatherings, so we can go deeper, uh, deeper together into God's presence in our divine service, uh, deeper into God's presence in his word, the big story that he's telling, and then deeper into love and care for one another. And as you notice, I'm in full regalia. Uh, and so notice a few things about, you know, why we do this. Uh, you know, on high festival Sundays, you know, we track the life of Jesus. So, you know, his birth, his baptism, transfiguration comes next where he's transfigured and he reveals his glory. Uh, then again, it's going to be uh, Maundy Thursday, no, Holy Thursday. You need to start calling it Holy Thursday. Good Friday, Easter Sunday is the next high festival because we're tracking the life of Jesus uh, through the half year of our Lord in, in the season. It's one of the things I, I really love about the Lutheran Church is the, the seasons of the church year. Uh, you know, it's not just every Sunday is just like the last. And so uh, you'll notice the, the color has changed. Uh, last week, you know what it was for Epiphany? It, it was green, uh, celebrating life, the revealing of who Jesus is. And now it's white for, usually for holiness, although in this case we could probably say the glory of Jesus. I don't know if this is whiter than any bleacher could bleach. Um, but this is from Jerusalem. Someone gave it to me. And then I'm going to remember to give the message from the pulpit today. I am going to remember that because I'm going to go, where's my stuff? Where's my Bible? And then I'll go, oh, right, it's in the pulpit. Uh, so I'm going to preach from the pulpit today. Again, to, to mark off and say, this Sunday isn't just like every other Sunday of the church here. We're celebrating something very specific, and in this case, the glory of Jesus as he reveals himself in the transfiguration. Uh, so we're looking only at you know, Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through, I think, about 13 or so. Uh, you know, a very short reading for this week. Uh, so our opening hymn, Let All Together Praise Our God, Please Stand. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. You may kneel or stand for the confession of sins. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
Father, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son, Jesus, to die for you. And for his sake, God forgives you all of your sins. As a servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We stand for the intro. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. The Lord reigns. Let the peoples tremble. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy the King in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. In peace let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
be with you. O oh God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in his glory and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Good morning. The prophetic reading is from uh, Kings chapter 2. When the world was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel, and the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know it. Keep quiet. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it keep quiet. Then Elijah said to him, please stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak and rolled it up and struck the water, and the water was parted to one side and to the other, till the two of them could go over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen, and he saw him no more. This is the word of the Lord. The apostolic reading is from Corinthians chapter 3 and 4. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, 
with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified, and a cloud overshadowed them overshadowed them and a voice came out of the cloud this is my beloved son listen to him and suddenly looking around they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only and as they were coming down the mountain he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the son of man had risen from the dead so they kept the matter to themselves questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say, I tell you that Elijah has come and they did to him whatever they please, as is written of him. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
uh, just a brief note about the reading. I, I so appreciate, Jane, the, you doing the reading. And then there are times where there are like names and Hebrew names and things like that. Uh, and so, you know, I was always taught Elijah and Elisha, but the Hebrew would be more like Elia and Elisha. It's just Elisha sounds like a girl's name, so we say Elisha. But anyway, I appreciate your boldness in, in reading, especially when it has difficult names. And we just go with it. You went more with the Hebrew pronunciation of the names, which I like because I love Hebrew. Well, not really. Uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you uh, send your kingdom here on earth as you already reign in heaven, that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us, that by your grace we may believe your holy word and live holy lives according to it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Mark chapter 9, you know, I was thinking about, you know, what, what do we talk about? In Bible study, we're doing this compare and contrast between the Mount of Transfiguration and Mount Calvary, or Golgotha, as Mark calls it. And there's these interesting parallels uh, between the two. And, and then I, I, what I wanted to talk about today is when Jesus says in chapter 9, verse 1, Amen, or it's translated truly, but it's the Hebrew word amen. Amen, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Who are these some, and where did they see the kingdom of God come with power? And, you know, the answer is kind of multifaceted. You know, you can kind of look at it from a few different point of, points of view. You know, who saw the kingdom of God after it had come with power? power? And the most obvious answer is, well, the transfiguration. You know, after six days, Jesus takes Peter and James and John. The sum are Peter and James and John, and they see Jesus, as he says, he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter is very excited about all this, because he just heard the kingdom of God is going to come with power, and you're going to see it. And he goes, "Woo! yes, this is it. This is the kingdom of God come with power. And there's a few different interpretations of, you know, what does it mean when he says, let's make three tents. And the way I take it is he's setting up a temporary headquarters. He's basically saying, let's set up shop. You know, let's make this our temporary headquarters for the new kingdom of God. You know, we've got those, the, those who are prophesied to come before the end of time. Moses, Deuteronomy chapter 18, where it says... The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And then in Malachi, it's, God says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and the awesome day of the Lord comes. And there's Peter. He sees Jesus, the one he knows is the Christ, the Messiah. There's Moses, the one who was prophesied, who would, you know, there would be a prophet like him. And then there's Elijah, who would come before the great and terrible day of Yahweh. Let's set up shop. Let's get this party started. And by party, I mean revolution. You know, let's overthrow the evil governments of the religious establishment in Jerusalem. Let's overthrow Caesar's power. And let's set up the kingdom of God, starting right here, the Mount of Transfiguration, right? But what's really going on at the Mount of Transfiguration? You know, I, I usually talk about it in terms of, it's kind of the flip side of the glory of the cross. The glory of the Transfiguration is obvious. It's visible. It's the kind of glory we like to see and to be a part of. It's visible. It's obvious. It's right there in front of you. And then there's the hidden glory of the cross, which we're going to get to in a second. But I want to talk about where did, where did this glory come from? Where did the glory of the transfiguration come from? You know, this radiance, uh, Jesus' radiance. Where did Moses and Elijah get their bodies? Now, as somebody said in Bible class, God can do whatever he wants. But what's he actually doing? And I suspect, you know, since Moses and Elijah's bodies were buried in a grave, you know, they were dust, and to dust they shall return, they got their bodies from the new creation, the new heavens, and the new earth. They're 
if you will, they're already living in that reality, and God has transported the new creation back in time to this moment, and we see Jesus in the new creation glory, and we see Elijah and Elisha in their new creation resurrected bodies. Now, am I sure that's the right interpretation? I really like it. I really like it. He's reaching into the future and bringing it into the present, reaching into the new creation and bringing it into into the now. But how do we get there? How do we get to that new creation? And the answer to the next question, who saw the kingdom of God after it has come with power? And it would be a centurion, a Roman centurion who sees the darkness, who sees the way Jesus died. And again, someone pointed out in Bible study, you know, the the darkness ends right at the time of Jesus' death. Because doesn't he say that in in chapter 9? You know, when he saw the way that Jesus had died. uh, Yeah. And uh, 1539. When the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. On the cross, Jesus pits his kingdom against the kingdoms of this world, the powers of this world, the religious powers, the earthly powers, the powers of Caesar, and we know from the temptation narrative, which we'll talk about next week, the powers of Satan. He does not rule the way this world rules. This world rules with power and authority and conquest. It says, you will do what I tell you or you will die. And Jesus says, I will die for you so that you can live. That's the true kingdom of God on earth. Where is it seen? Where is this glory seen? At the cross. And who sees it? A centurion, a Gentile dog, as he would have been called. And then there's a few women who were bold enough to come out to the crucifixion as well. Paul puts it this way in Colossians 2.15. God disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Christ. Paul says it a little bit more eloquently than Mark, but Mark tells it in story form, that the glory of God is to be seen on the cross. Then there's a third way I think that there's some who see the the kingdom of God after it's come with power. In, In Mark 16, verse 6 and 7, the angels say to the women, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. There you will see him, the resurrected Lord. And those who went to Galilee, his 12 disciples, along with the women, would have seen the kingdom of God, after it had come with power because the resurrection vindicated Jesus, proved that the victory was to be had on the cross. Uh, Then there's a a fourth place we can look to see the kingdom of God after it's come with power, and that's the destruction of Jerusalem, um, the the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70. Uh, He talks about this in Mark chapter 13. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not to be, uh, and I'll agree with the Gospel of Luke that he's talking about Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, uh, the armies of Rome, and he describes it in these terms, if you're willing to agree with my interpretation of this, and you should because I'm right. But never believe what I say, always verify it for yourself. Mark 13, 26. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in, in... clouds with great power and glory. What is this picture of? It's a picture of the one who was trampled on, the one who was, if you will, thrown into the lion's den, the one who was crucified, now being exalted, and those who opposed him being thrown down. And so all of Jerusalem who opposed Jesus gets trampled on while Jesus is exalted to the highest place. And then there's the fifth place that I've just found interesting, and it has to do with that word transfiguration. It's, it's uh, you know, it says he was transfigured before them. But, but listen to what Paul says in Romans 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Same word, transformed, transfigured. Be like Jesus. 
Be transfigured. Be transformed like Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And then he says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, Uh, We all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, transfigured, same word, into the same image from one degree of glory to another. You'll notice I'm pulling from the Apostle Paul because he says it so eloquently, so beautifully. But being transformed by the renewal of our mind, um, beholding beholding the glory of the Lord, being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, That's straight from the Gospel of Mark, is it not? That we be like Jesus. Jesus bids us follow him. He says, come after me. He says, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Become, in other words, like me. We live the cruciform life, the cross-shaped life. We're constantly dying so that we can rise again to new life. And once again, there's a temptation that we all want is, give me seven steps to the cross-shaped life. There are no seven steps. There are too many variations. But what it truly is, is a way of thinking, is it not? For, For the disciples in the Gospel of Mark, it's stick with Jesus, listen to Jesus, ask questions of Jesus, follow Jesus all the way through the cross, all the way to resurrection. But it's more like an attitude of the mind. As Paul says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Why? How? By the renewal of your mind. This is a way of thinking. It's not six steps or seven steps or four principles or ten whatevers. It's a totally different way of thinking from the ways of this world. Again, the ways of this world, I think we all know this, It's not the ways of politics. It's not the ways of world governments. It's not the way of world religions. It's not the power structures of this world that use force and use coercion. It's the way of Jesus. It's the way of the cross. It's a way of thinking. It's an attitude. It's a behavior that says, this isn't about me. This isn't about me winning. It's, in fact, about me dying to myself, dying to my hopes, dying to my dreams, dying to my wants, dying to my desires. Did you come here for that message? It's not what we want to hear, but it is the way that we can reach into the future reality, the new heavens and the new earth, and bring that to the here and bring that to the now. Uh, If you ever do history... Uh, it, it's usually a great man view of history. Who do you look at when you talk about history? You look at Caesar, you know, Julius Caesar, and Caesar Augustus, and Napoleon, and George Washington, and Jefferson. Those are the people, we look at the great men. But tell me if this is true. Look at all the great things those great men accomplished, and compare that to a single person who sets aside their wants, their desires, their hopes, their dreams, who gains the self-control that's the, f- the power of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit. A person who says, I'm not going to do this for me. I'm going to do this for you because Jesus loves you and I love you too. Who accomplished more great things? That person in that one act of self-sacrifice and self-giving for the sake of the gospel or all the great things that whatever great man you want to talk about, Napoleon, Washington, Jefferson, whatever president you happen to like, all the great things they did compared to that one act of kindness, one act of goodness, one act of faithfulness that a follower of Jesus does. I'll tell you what I think is more powerful. That's where I see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. When we love one another, when we gather to be in God's presence around his word and sacraments, when we dig deeper into God's story and seek to become a part of it, when we love and we care for one another, I go, that's the kingdom of God come with power. Amen? Yes, amen. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we we thank you that you don't use the, the power structures of this world to accomplish your kingdom and bring it about. You don't use 
uh, defeating our enemies and bringing them into submission and forcing them to do our will. But instead, it is through the sacrifice of Jesus and our joining in Jesus that you accomplish such great things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We respond to God's word by speaking the true faith and the words of the Nicene Creed. Please stand. I believe in one God. Be seated. We respond to God's word with our prayers. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Faithful Lord, thank you for the rich and deep heritage we have in our church family. Let us celebrate our liturgical heritage deeply rooted in the truth of your word and sacraments. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, Lord of love, send your Holy Spirit upon us to lead us to a deeper love for one another, as Jesus loved us, so that all people around us will look at us and say, see how they love one another. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, you have placed your word on our hearts and on our lips. Lead each of us to live and speak our faith as a regular part of life by recognizing and praying for our VIPs by name to know you more deeply, by partnering with others and praying for our VIPs, and by preparing next step invitations for our VIPs as you give opportunity. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Father, you are the great physician, the only one who can heal us. Bless all who are sick or suffering in this life, especially those whom we have named before you in our hearts, including Jim Peeper after his heart attack. Give them the healing that they desire so that they may serve you more fully, or give them the grace to endure their affliction. Lord, in your mercy. Good and gracious Father, we ask your continued blessings to your servants celebrating birthdays this week, especially Claire. You have granted her all the days of her life, that she may know your loving kindness, abide in the confession of your care and protection, and in all things give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Father, into your hands we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We respond to God's word with our tithes and offerings, which are collected in the back. We join in singing the offertory, Please Stand.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who at his transfiguration revealed his glory to his disciples, that they might be strengthened to proclaim his cross and resurrection, and with all the faithful look forward to the glory of life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of Jesus' body and blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat Jesus' body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, As I prepare the Lord's table, you may prepare your hearts and examine yourselves to eat before you eat and drink of Jesus' body and blood. Here are some words uh, from your order of service for you to meditate on. In Numbers 13, the 12 spies brought back grapes, figs, and pomegranates from the promised land. It was a foretaste of the good things that were to come. It was a promise of better things, the hope that God's people had. So it is in the Lord's Supper. Now we eat bread and drink wine, which Jesus says are his body and blood. This is a promise that later we will dine with Jesus face to face for all eternity. And now hear the words of institution of our Lord's Supper. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, Jesus took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Genesis 2.15, the creation called unto uh, existence by the Lord that arranged the lasted until, until sin came into equation. Then fear came with it. Adam and Eve hid from their accountability and fear of the Lord. To fail as a steward in this way deserves death. From that moment on, as stewards, they would never... Uh, 
fully measure up. Death is the lasting legacy. Until Jesus, when the simple gift of Jesus is offered in, in the babe of Bethlehem and the Christ of the cross, fear gives way to faith. Jesus took accountability for our failed stewardship and we were restored, baptized into Christ. The Holy Spirit creates faith, which leads to a restoration of faithful stewardship. Set on this new path, the stewardship, the steward's accountability is balanced between fear and faith. We know that we are accountable to live and work for the Lord. When we succeed, it is God's, uh, God's credit. When we fail, we fail in Christ. Uh, in Christ leads us to confession and absolution, absolution, which once again sets us on the path of faithful stewardship. The use of God's simple gifts is captured in the words of the psalmist. Fear the Lord uh, leads to work. Work leads to blessings. Faith sees this blessings as a gift from God. The baptized steward sees this and clearly confesses that it is indeed well with us. May the Lord lead us to this uh, triune stewardship of his simple gifts. Prayer. Lord, as your stewards, we work in fear of our shortcomings and sin and faith in Christ's redemption and restoration and eager desire to serve as faithful stewards of your simple gifts. Lead us by grace through faith to see, rejoice, and serve in this faithful stewardship. As you have blessed us with your work in Jesus, may our work as stewards be a blessing to others. Amen. Judy? All right, we have quite a few ministry opportunities coming up. So uh, Wednesday... Uh, 9 a.m. at the Lodge at Mallard's Landing. We have Bible study, and then 10.30 here, we have the women's study. And then in the evening, we're going to start our uh, soup suppers, And but this we're going to start with Ash Wednesday. And I have it set, scheduled for 6.45. Uh, so if you want the ashes on your forehead, we're going to eat, and then I'm going to come in here, and you can make your way in here, and I'll put the ashes on your forehead before the service starts. And I haven't thought about those people who arrive late. Do I say tough or do I say go to Chris? <laughs> you, well, I said six for soup and then 6.45 for Ash Wednesday. The service will start about 6.45, but you'll get the ashes on your head before the service starts. Somebody can do it. Yeah, but I'll do, I'll do it up to the time I start the service. Maybe, maybe. Uh, then you're, you're going to see uh, Wednesdays through Lent, we're going to do, uh, I, I like calling them Lenten gatherings. We have soup for half an hour. We sing Lenten songs for half an hour. The Lenten songs are just the best. They are so good. People say they're dirges. And it's like, no, they soar. They're in a minor key, and they just soar the grace of God. Uh, and then a half hour of Bible study in the Gospel of Mark. And then, of course, uh, Holy Week comes up starting March 24 with Easter, uh, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter. Uh, to prepare for that, we're going to have a spring clean, spring clean, uh, and resurrection is going to be helping us. And so that's going to be a great opportunity to get to know them a little bit better uh, and tell them what to do. Because, you know, we know what needs to be done and they have the energy to do it. Something like that. Okay. Um, it's a Saturday. Yeah. 9 a.m. Yes. All right. I think, I think that's it. Oh, chili. Yeah. The last Saturday of February, we're having a chili feed. The last Sunday of February, we are having a chili feed. And again, Resurrection is going to join us, and they're going to be bringing food. So we do ask, you know, every family bring something. So for example, I'm bringing Monica. <laughs> no, um, our, you know, Monica will bring something for our family because she's that way. So just bring something. Uh, and there's a sign-up sheet in the back, which I totally forgot to mention the sign-up sheet. 
Okay. Sign up to attend and sign up to bring food. Sign both of those if you would. If you don't bring food, that's okay. We love you. We'll let you eat. Yes. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, so a long time ago, I read this book called All the Prayers of the Bible, and I constructed this 31-day prayer booklet, and Monica didn't like my translation that I used because I used the New American Standard, which is really stilted. Uh, so she went and did the work of getting it in from the NIV, which she really likes, and then I even got permission from NIV. Uh, right. But these are, these, are scripture, these are the prayers of Scripture, which I don't know about you, but praying on my own, I tend to circle the drain where I start out praying to God and then I end up complaining. Uh, but these prayers just soar. They, 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 they elevate you beyond yourself to the kind of prayers that you'd say, if I could pray, this is the way I'd want to pray. So there's 31 prayers in there, as well as prayers for each day of the week that I came up with in some way, shape, or form. I stole it from somebody. So join us for fellowship, join us for coffee, join us, there's goodies, right? All right. And I hope for you who are on Google Meet, I hope the sound was, actually, you could hear what was being said today. So I hope you're there and go forth and serve the Lord and have fellowship.